Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you because we know that we have worshipped in your presence. We know that we are always in your presence. Help us to acknowledge that fully uh, and in its entirety, Lord, knowing full well that you also want to teach us something this morning about you and us in you. Pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that uh, your word will infiltrate, will imbibe, will become part of, will change and transform each and every one of us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. That didn't sound like a decent, resounding enough amen. 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 Anybody else? Amen. Thank you. Amen. See? Thank you. That's enough now. So... Who was here two weeks ago when I spoke? Okay, what did I speak on? What do you remember from it? Beyond Ghostbusters theme tune being on. Jesus was in a Gentile area and when he got out of the boat there was uh, a man who was... We'll try that again. Let's do it with this microphone. <laughs> Talk to my chest. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on a minute. There you go, Joe. Um, Jesus got out of the boat and they were in a Gentile area and there was a man possessed of many demons and Jesus took the demons out of the man, put them in a herd of pigs and they went into the lake. Thank you. It's a good summary of the whole story. It's brilliant. What else did we learn? Yes, you're going to have to talk vaguely to my wire. Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> Eunice, do you have something to say? No, okay. <laughs> Who needs enemies when you have... Anyway. <laughs> Anybody else? Where have I got somebody waving? Oh, sorry, Dorothy. Um, and the demons went into the pigs and the people in the town didn't want him to stay around. They want him to leave the um, town. That's absolutely true. The power of Christ or the power of the Holy Spirit had done some miraculous thing, yet the people's reaction of the Gentile land was, Get out! Oh, no, that's too much for us. Better the devil you know springs to mind rather than uh, the God that we wanted to know. Yeah, the whole point was that we were talking about uh, two weeks ago, uh, Jesus casting out uh, the demon-possessed man, the territorial type thing of the Gentile land was so filled with Satan, it's quite frightening but the very presence of Jesus walking on that land and as that devil possessed man come at his feet he had to fall prostrate at his feet before Jesus even said anything so actually the very presence of the power of the Holy Spirit coursing through Jesus was enough for that man to have to collapse in front of his feet for the demons to have to go we are now in the presence of God and we translated that to us in the fact that we carry God within us through the power of the Holy Spirit yes so therefore then, the very presence of us walking the land, we are walking the presence of the kingdom of God wherever we go. Yes. And so therefore then, there is Jesus in a Gentile land. He could have been a more contaminating land for a Jew, you know, in the fact that he was near a herd of pigs and demon possession and, and he was actually walking on Gentile land. For a Jew, that got to be the most defiling place for him to be. Yet, they do not contaminate him. He contaminates them with the kingdom of God. And therefore, that is our job as well as church. We don't get contaminated by the world. And I put that in inverted commas. By the world. We contaminate. Yeah. We contaminate. The world. So this concept of, oh, I can't go into that. Blah, 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 blah. I'm going to be contaminated. Boof out the door. Because that's ridiculous. We carry Jesus. We carry more power than is in the world. Amen. Can you try and believe it and sound like it? Thank you. Right. We will carry on. So we're back with Jesus. Gentiles didn't want him. Kick him out. Oh, no, please go away. So Jesus gets back in the boat and went back to the other side of the lake. Matthew 5, verse 21. Where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. 
pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realised at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. The frightened woman, trembling at the realisation of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. While he was still speaking to her, the messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. Then the crowd stopped, sorry, then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead, she's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him. But he made them all leave, and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha, kum, which means, little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened, and then he told them, Give her something to eat. Well-known story. If you've read your Bible ever, most of us would know something to do with, especially the woman, menstrual bleeding. We will know the story. And yes, it's keyly involving... Um, it means faith, ultimately. Both stories. It's a sandwich... Remember I said Mark has a way of uh, sandwiching one thing in amongst another story to try and display something going on. In this case, faith. But let's see, shall we? So, Jesus chased out of Gentile land, gets in the boat, returns back, effectively back to Capernaum, more than likely, where, as we know, Jesus had been staying anyway in Peter's uh, house, and had done teaching and healing and miracles. So he's returned back. And we have a complete contrast. We've got the Gentiles saying, get out, get out, leave us alone. And on the other side, he's got people waiting for him. Crowd, can't wait to welcome Jesus. And it sounds all marvellous and wonderful, doesn't it? But let's remember something. In Mark, when there involves anything to do with a crowd of people, or people seeking Jesus out... It is actually a negative. The seeking is almost they're hunting him down to trap him. A crowd of people is effectively the same thing. But we have the biggest surprise welcome in the name of Jairus. Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Now, synagogue rulers had responsibility for administration. Their role was administration, maintenance and the booking of speakers on the Sabbath day, like, for instance, Jesus booking in a rabbi. They themselves never did any teaching, but they were, that was their role. And he would have been well known by the community and he would have been treated with high respect because he's the ruler of the synagogue. So for him to come 
and fall at Jesus' feet. You made us stand too long, Carleen. That's what it is. Teeth back in. For him to stand at, uh, fall at Jesus' feet, surprise, surprise, surprise. No way would any respectable synagogue ruler do that. Now, he might well have known who Jesus was. He might well have previously had Jesus booked in to come and speak at the synagogue. He might have seen the miracles that Jesus has done. So in verse 23, when he makes this statement, my little girl is dying, please come and lay your hands on her, heal her so she can live, it is a statement of faith, probably based on the fact that he believes he's seen him do stuff like this. Maybe not raise the dead, but perform miracles of healing, casting out the demonic. So it's not just, uh, how can I put this? Um, he just had a brilliant idea one day. He's heard about this Jesus randomly. And he thought this would be a good idea. This actually might be based on actual knowledge. Nonetheless, it's still a major statement of faith, is it not? My daughter, by the way, who's 12, is dying right now. She is at death's door, literally. Yet I know if you come now and lay hands on her, she will live. If you are willing... And the whole idea of him being pleading fervently, he's obviously saying, please be willing to come and do this. I want you to come and do this. His pleading emphasises he's really hoping that Jesus is willing. So what can we learn from Jairus? It's a real question, real answers. What can you suddenly learn from that moment from Jairus? It's going to be one of those mornings. He have faith in Jesus. He have faith in this Rabbi Jesus. Yes. Anybody else? I'm going to go to here first. He knows how to treat authority. He knows how to treat authority. Okay. Interesting. He had faith because he saw. He didn't have faith because he hadn't seen he saw he had faith because he'd seen Jesus do these things okay he had faith because he um you know a lot of that is speculation on our part but it more than likely is true sorry to make sure I don't go his faith in Jesus was greater than worrying about what other synagogue people would think possibly yeah yeah leaders are not immune from troubles leaders are not immune from trouble amen Timmy Anybody else? Could you come in a bit? <laughs> I think he, I think he's, um, I think he's um, humble as well because, because of his position, he could have asked one of his officers to ask Jesus to please come to. Uh, Belinda, that's it. That's for me the lesson that we should be learning on this one. Is actually Jairus's humility. Don't forget, Jesus is still at this time just a geezer. He's just a rabbi to them. Clearly been blessed by God, but beyond that, he's just a bloke. There's no concept of him being the Messiah, death and resurrection happening. None of that exists in their mindset at the moment. He is just a rabbi who's got some amazing authority of teaching, able to cast out demons, able to do healing. So he's not sort of, so for Jairus, this is just another rabbi that I book in every Saturday. Do you see the point? But for him to come out here and to fall at this man's feet socially, that would have just been damaging to him. He, but he just went, no, I'm going to let go of my pride. I'm going to shame myself before all these people because the love for my daughter more than overwhelms anything else I hang on to. This 12-year-old daughter, but by the way, remember, excuse me, uh, sisters in the house, but in that culture, you were nothing. I don't mean that in a really rude, you know, I'm you're with me, yeah? Okay? But in that culture, you weren't worth a lot. And especially a kid, 12-year-old, right, she's just about brewing up for, for being married off. But nonetheless, so for this synagogue ruler, for his 12-year-old daughter, who he 
clearly loved. He said, that's enough love there for me that I am going to come and humble myself. I am going to shame myself before everybody else who knows me in this town. For Jairus, I think that's amazing. And he did it so that somebody else, i.e. his daughter, could be touched by Jesus. By touched by God. Not for himself. Note this. question I want to learn from Jairus is are we willing to shame ourselves to let go of our pride so that someone might be touched by Jesus allow that question just to sit are we allowed to let go of our cultural pride whatever that is our societal pride our position, our understanding, so that somebody else can be touched by Jesus. Verse 24. Jesus went with him and all the people followed, crowding around him. So at this point, people crowding around Jesus, this is obstructive type of crowding. Here is Jesus on a mission, yet constant people are wanting to crowd around Jesus. They're wanting their needs sorted out. He's on a journey to go and heal a dying person, yet the crowd are stopping him from moving at a decent pace. In Mark, it's an obstructive crowd. It's them clamouring for what they want from him. It's not a good crowd. There's a moment, I don't know if you know this week, that uh, Pope Francis uh, on the BBC News, uh, there was a clip of him in Mexico where he appears to be greeting, blessing the crowd from a particular standpoint. And if you look really closely in this 20 second clip or something, you can see there's clearly somebody sat down, I'm assuming in a, a, a wheelchair or something. And he's trying to see them, other people are clambering from his hands. And the BBC recorded this in a rare loss of composure. Pope Francis has shouted at a crowd in Mexico after he was pulled and almost fell over. And then you need to look at the translation of what Pope Francis was doing. He was simply stating at them, don't be selfish. Not about him being pulled. He was saying to the crowd, stop being selfish. I wait. Interesting how it was recorded. In my view, it could have been slightly reported differently. But here we have, therefore, then a crowd selfish crowd clambering around Jesus. Meet my needs now. I mean, they're delaying a sick 12-year-old from being healed from death. How selfish can you get? They believe that their need is more pressing. Their heart, quite frankly, was in the wrong place. Their need of Jesus was right, but what they wanted from him maybe was not right. Quite frankly, if it was, I think we would have had more recordings in the three synoptic gospels, because all three of them have got this story, Matthew, Mark and Luke, have all got this story in one form or another, and actually you see nothing else happening in their recording other than Jesus trying to make his way to this 12-year-old. You don't see anything else of him touching anybody else. I've got a question here. Can we speculate as to why Jesus didn't meet their needs at that time? This selfish crowd. Why did Jesus... It's just a bit of speculation. It's a bit of, by the way, this is the way you can read the Bible all our time, is allow your mind to be in the story. It's a good Jewish way of reading it. Why do you think Jesus didn't meet any of the other people's needs at the time? I think Jesus wouldn't allow anyone to distract him from what 
he came to do. He just will do what is right at the right time. Yep. What they wanted may not have been what they needed. What they wanted may not have been what they needed, absolutely. God the Father hadn't told him to actually minister to lots and lots of individuals because he only did what God the Father told him to do. Correct, Denzel. Thank you. Jesus never, never, he said, I'm only ever doing what the Father tells me to do. I'm only where my Father is working. And the Father may not have wanted to do anything there because of all the other reasons. Think about our own circumstances, your own circumstances. Asking the question, why has God not done X? I am not going to give you a fantastic sermon on the marvellous way and curious way to which our God works. But he knows best. I'm glad, grateful for that. Because if he gave me all the wishes I wanted, I would be in a terrible two and eight. Uh, state, by the way, sorry. Using Cockney rhyme saying, I'd be in a terrible state. Sorry, slight, slight uh, Sunnyfield Middle School coming back. Why was I there? Oh, Wednesday Fellowship. At the Wednesday Fellowship, we went for a whole lot of Cockney rhyming slang. And I did quite well. Thank you, Ian. And I did quite well, which is a bit of a problem. <laughs> and that's where it kicked in. So God knows best. And we have to recognise that at times. And it's sometimes it's painful, especially when we're in the midst of it. And we're thinking, please, please. And God's going, as I said, there's always three possible answers. Yes, no, and wait. There's no other answers from God, by the way. Yes, no, and wait. We most certainly don't like the middle one, the no. And the wait is really painful. And the yes is like, great, I just got my credit card out and paid for it instantly. But boy, you might have to pay later in the respect of that God will ask you to do more and more. The interest has already been covered by Jesus and the whole debt. Don't worry about that. So he knows best. And then we have this woman sandwiched right in between this story, this journeying story. A woman in the crowd has suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. Notice she's had it for 12 years. This girl is 12 years old. So for as long as this girl's been living, this woman has been suffering. No other key significance there other than the 12, and there's obviously some other stuff behind that, but quite frankly, a lot of it will be speculation after a while. This woman would have been constantly ritually unclean because the menstrual cycle means that uh, once you've been menstrual cycle, you then have to go away, you're ritually unclean for seven days, and then you can come back, and it's an Old Testament law. By the way, it is not meaning that, um, which can be mistaken, was mistaken, and it means it's some big sin. It wasn't a sin. It's to do with health and hygiene for the whole community. They, do, they don't have then what we have now. And I'm just trying to be very... Um, Socially conscious in everything I'm saying right now. So really, she was an outsider in the community through no fault of her own, constantly. And of course, she'd spent, as you can imagine, spending all her money on the doctors to try and get her fixed. And she never actually got better. She just got worse. This is, by the way, not to decry the medical profession at all. Okay, let's make this very clear. This is just actually a point now of identifying very simply that human understanding, human knowledge, and ability is limited compared to God. Always has been, always will be. So our nameless woman, notice she is nameless, 
out nameless woman wants from Jesus healing. But unlike the crowd who are jostling to be in Jesus' face, could you imagine that? You're walking along. Imagine you're walking along Greenford right now. And people are getting in your face, shoving something, sort this up sort this child out or I got this problem and can you make a judgment call here and can you heal this gammy leg or something you know imagine that going on as you're trying to make your way to the shops and it's lots of people and it's endless tell me here who wouldn't get angry God's telling you to do nothing and these people you can't do anything you're not allowed to heal them God is saying do nothing and you're trying to smile serenely at them. Saying, I'm trying to... These people are in his face. And she comes up from behind with a faith and a thought that states, if I just touch his robe, if I just, by the way, the Greek better version, if I touch the tassel of his garment as a good following Jew, well, that will be enough. There's faith. Now you think to yourself, where does that thought come from? Well, just think it's just some random thought she decided to have. Well, there was some superstitious around uh, Alexander the Great. It was believed that if you touched just the hem of his cloak, etc., you would be healed. That such is the aura that supposedly came from him. So probably in here was a little bit of mix of suspicion. Supersti sorry, superstition, thank you love superstition mixed in maybe just a bit but she still had faith in her limited understanding and she didn't want the attention neither she wanted zero attention she just wanted to slip in on behind you know crowd through the legs could you imagine she would have been on hands and knees and people probably would have known who she was if they saw her. And there she is, just, just going to slip in. Ah, touched. And then back on out. And let it keep moving away from her. Just, if you've got that vision in your head, what that looks like. So she's got down on her hands and knees in the dirt and the muck. No different from Jairus. Touches the hem of his garment. And it would have to have been because it would have been sort of down there somewhere. Touch the hem of his garment. And nobody need know. She doesn't want to speak to him. She just needs a bit of healing. The power that I've heard about. Maybe even witnessed herself. No one need know. And immediately the bleeding stopped. And she could feel in her body that she'd been healed of her terrible condition. Wow. Wow. She knows she's been healed. Now, let's be honest, most of us, if we've suddenly known after 12 years of that sort of bleeding, or any kind of illness, because I realise actually I'm excluding all the men in the house, that kind of healing's happened, would we be really subtle about it and just go, I'm just going to slip out the back door? <laughs> let's be honest, we'd be up here going, I've got a test of me to tell! But this woman, nope, wants to slip away. Why? Well, maybe she's been so used to being almost outcast constantly, she feels damaged. Maybe this hasn't happened, but she knew it happened. So maybe she just thought, well, nobody's going to believe me. Nobody's going to want to talk to me. Because don't forget, by the, way, by, the, by the way, by being ritually unclean, anybody that touched her that day had to then stay out of the community until the evening themselves. Not for seven days, just until the evening. So most people probably would have avoided her if she was well known. Maybe she just had enough people shunning her and she wanted to walk away. But then I love this. Verse 31, 30 to 31, I think is absolutely hilarious. Firstly, Jesus realises at once that healing power has gone out of him. And then he asked the crowd, who touched my robe? And his disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? I think that's funny. I think the disciples make me laugh because we're like them. They think that Jesus is purely talking about a physical touch. 
I mean, can you imagine a jostling crowd bashing up against each other? Right? What? Jesus, you are kidding me, aren't you? Have you seen this lot? Give me a break. Who out of all this lot are you asking who touched you? They're all touching you. He's not talking about physical. He's talking about a faith touch. How often do you think of things that God is asking you or us to do that are actually something we see from a physical point of view? We assume because we can physically see it, that's where God is asking us to be and go. Actually, God, it isn't. He's maybe asking us to do things that at the moment we can't see. He's asking us to walk in faith. It's what our Shekinah evenings are about at the moment. It's about us listening to our God, seeing what he's asking us, what he wants us to do. Which may be funny enough, at the moment we can't physically see. So easy for us to take everything so literal. And God is saying, no, 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 no. Something else going on. But Jesus kept on looking around to see who had done it. When the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him. And she told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Did Jesus really know who actually touched him? Was he sort of feigning, trying to pretend that he didn't see who had touched him? I think that would make our Jesus out to be a little bit of a liar. No. Holy Spirit could have well told him. If it was necessary, I'm sure. And maybe he did know. And maybe he didn't. Remember, Jesus did everything in the power of the Holy Spirit not in his own divinity. What was the point of him needing to identify this woman, her needing to come forward and admit what she had done and display herself before the crowd? Well, for Jesus, well, for this woman, she just wanted something from him. Jesus was quite happy to, up to a point, to give something But what he wanted to do was actually to meet the someone. Jesus doesn't want in-person encounters. He doesn't want people who just know about him. He doesn't want people who just want something from him. He wants to know somebody relationally. He wants a relationship. So he wanted to know who the woman was. Plus also, she had to publicly stand up in front and declare herself as somebody who's received something from Jesus. There needed to be this element of acknowledgement, a public acknowledgement that yes, this I have just gained life effectively from God through this man. We have to be identified with him as well. And Jesus' response to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. By publicly identifying, she is now regarded as affectionately in that term of daughter. Also then also said that your faith has made you well. Plus also now, of course, the community is going to have seen the fact that she's been healed. So she becomes richly clean again. That is also to be, go in peace, it's all over, do not worry. Your suffering is over. To me, publicly identifying yourself with Jesus means, and then it's go in peace, it's all over. It's not just for the short term, it's for the long term as well. As we publicly confess that we are followers and lovers of Jesus Christ and we have received something from him, i.e. eternal life, we can go in peace. We can walk around in peace, not suffering. And we're publicly telling people. Oh, you thought I was going to talk about healing today, didn't you? Nah. Not yet. 
It's about being publicly identified, not slipping in the crowd, hopefully unnoticed that actually I'm touched by Jesus. We should be up the top going, touched by Jesus! How else are people going to know? Here's a posing question for you. I want you to note something very clear. What was Jesus' role throughout the entire time of being healed? It's a really simple question. What was Jesus' role? What did Jesus do to, for this woman to be healed? What did he do? Sorry? Did nothing. Look at this. She, he was walking along the crowd. She slipped on behind. She was healed immediately. She touched the rope. Jesus, the man, did nothing. She was healed before he even knew who she was. Isn't that a bit of a mind blower? Because we read that story with this assumption that Jesus actually turned and did something or said something or stated something. And all of the, other than Matthew, who we know took it from Mark and probably slightly, all the others have it down that Jesus actually effectively did nothing. But he did. And this was it. His relationship with the Father. His walking in the Spirit was everything. His relationship with the Father, therefore then, his walking in the Spirit, means he was filled so much that no matter what he did or didn't do, that touch was enough. He walked the kingdom of God, the presence of God. It's the same as that demonic moment. Jesus actually did nothing other than get out of the boat. And the demon-possessed man went, fell down flat on his face in front of him. Jesus hadn't said a word at that point. Just the very presence of God coursing through Jesus was enough. Guess what? Look at yourselves. It's the same. I keep coming back to this. Jesus was a man. Philippians 2 makes it very clear. He gave up his divinity right, became the very nature of a servant, so that he could identify fully with us, and it's in the power of the Spirit that he performed all these miracles. So the same goes with you. Your relationship with the Father. Living in the Spirit. Only doing as Denzel said, what the Father tells you to do. And he might say, just walk down that street. And you do nothing but being actively engaged with God as you're walking. And gosh, something can happen without you having to do anything. How many times have you prayer walked the street and then we know you're just prayer walking in the street. You don't actually do anything else but prayer walk in the spirit with God. And there's something, well I've got a witness to this, there's something in the demonic breaks over that street. And it changes the atmosphere. It's the same. If you follow Jesus Christ and you're baptised in the spirit, you all have it. There should be a bit of a resounding amen at this point, please. You have to actually believe it. Because guess what? It doesn't depend upon you. It depends on who he is. If it depended on us, boy, this world would be... But it depends upon him. If you didn't hear what I just heard, something just fell. It depends on him, not on us. So wherever you walk, it can happen. And there's, there's stories in Acts uh, where shadows and hankies have got the power of Jesus. We'll come to that one other time when we have the time. But it depends upon God, not upon us. Our job is to be in relationship with him, to give him all the glory, to him to be our focus. Amen? Amen. Don't you want that? I mean, there are times that we're then called to actually do something and step out like Jairus and embarrass ourselves. Like running around flicking water at everybody, thinking I'm going to get somebody's wrath in a minute. I only did that once many years ago. I actually went up into somebody's face. 
who I consider can be known to maybe snap at me, and I chucked the wall, really asking me to do this, God. Chucked it in their face, and it's exactly what they needed at that time. I didn't know. And this morning, it's exactly the same. I just felt what God was calling to do. Don't make a habit of it. Sometimes call to embarrass ourselves. So she's healed. Jesus is talking to her. Notice this. While he was still speaking to her, so that wasn't his only words to her. Probably just a little bit more of a chat with her. Messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. Here we have the normal reaction, she's dead. Actually, the interruption of healing one other person has now caused pain and death to another. Now here, this is part and parcel of a, uh, uh, what is meant to happen. But it makes me think about that jostling crowd, getting one in their own needs. Actually, if we're selfish, we're selfish, wanting to get in front of somebody else for something, we could well be delaying God being able to do something else in someone else. Good lesson for us to learn. It doesn't mean we think our problems are less than somebody else's, but we seek God. We don't do almost what that crowd did in Mexico to Pope Francis, trying to grab his hand while he's trying to do something with somebody else. And you can imagine the attenders, just go home, don't bother. This verse 36, Jesus overheard, is probably not well translated in NLT. It's actually better done in the NIV in this particular case, which is... They ignored, he ignored the report. Jesus decided not to listen and take on board what they have just said. Do you get the point? He's ignored it. He's not being rude to them. What he's saying is, nah, not listening to that, not having any of that. Effectively, I don't believe what you've just heard. Yes, in man's sight it's all over, but actually with Jesus on the scene, anything is possible. Amen? It don't look at these circumstances now, look at Jesus. Forget what's being said, just move on. What's that famous 1966 World Cup commentary line? They think it's all over. It is now. Get Jesus on the sub and you've got a whole different new game. It's that sort of thing. Sorry, I thought we had a load of football nuts in the house. I hate the sport, but even that came into my head, I was preparing. They think it's all over, it is now. Get Jesus on, you've got another game. You've got at least another three minutes injury time. Three, Trinity. That was pretty good, actually, wasn't it? Anyway, moving on. But Jesus isn't bothered. He doesn't even turn to the attendees, the reporters of the message. He just doesn't even bother challenging them. He, no, he just turns to Jairus and says, don't be afraid, just have faith. And he says that to all of us sometimes. Don't be afraid, just have faith. Don't try and defend me. There's no need to. I, I, God, don't need defending. It looks like it's all over, but it ain't. I'm in the game. I'm in the picture. I can almost seem to, Jesus wanted to turn around to Jairus and said, have you just seen what's just happened with the lady over there? Have you just seen that? I know Jesus wouldn't sort of talk in that sort of manner, but you get the point. Have you just seen that? Just have faith. And I can imagine Jairus, for that entire time, I can imagine him going, come on, crowd, get out of the way. I want him to get to my daughter. Oh, no, really? Her? Oh, she's been like this for 12 years. Really? Do you see the... I can imagine some of the uh, attitude. But then verse 37, I love this line. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him. I love it. Jesus then stopped the crowd. That's it. You lot, that's enough. Come no further. You've been a distraction to this man's faith, distraction to the kingdom work. You've had a field day and now you are to stop. And I 
always love a good tune on a mobile kicking in at the right moment. When does Jesus say to those who are distractors from his gospel and his working, say to them, that's it, you have now had your time, stop. That's uncomfortable, isn't it? But actually in the New Testament, in new times, there are times that Jesus says to people, you have distracted my people, my church, from actually doing what they're meant to be doing. Now you stop. You go no further. Enough is enough. Does it both in the church and outside? We recognised last week, did we not, those who were here last week, that we were in a serious warfare here in the middle of the church. We had to break that by doing almost the Jericho walk, yes? Thank you very much. We're actually in the spiritual battle. It's not against flesh and blood that we are fighting. It is against the dark powers and the rulers of this world, yes? Yes. And he'll use anything or anyone to distract us. And there is a time that God then says, that's it. You have had your time. Stop. And then he won't let anyone else go with him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. So he stops them from some distance because they now come to the home of the synagogue ruler. Maybe he wants to have a quick chat with the three of them as they're walking towards. Note there is an inner circle of disciples. You've got the 12, and he's always got then his little three uh, inner circle gathering disciples. It's not a clique group. It's not a clique. But it's clearly evident, biblically, that both through the old and into the new, that there are times there are some people who they're not more important than anybody else, but within a church setting, there is a group whose role it is to be gifted and trusted with certain key information or to have that inner workings of knowing what's going on. And you've got this here. It's clearly evident. It's not a clique. Now let's get that right. I don't know why I've got this message here for that, but it came to me this week. It is not a clique, but there is clearly for Jesus, he's in a circle. I bet the other nine disciples didn't have a major epi over it, but one did. His name is Judas. But the rest didn't. So takes them in. Takes them in. Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? This child isn't dead, she's only asleep. The crowd laughed at the, him, but he made them all leave. And he took the girl's father and mother and the three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kom, which means little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up, walked around, and they were totally overwhelmed and amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And then he told them to give her something to eat. Professional mourners. It was quite well known to pay for professional mourners. To pay for professional mourners. And professional mourners, they wouldn't know if somebody's dead or not. So for Jesus then to come and say, well, she's not dead, she's asleep. You can imagine then their reaction. But they were she was definitely dead. This is, some would believe this was a resuscitation moment, not a resurrection moment. But that just can't make sense when you've got professional mourners recorded here as knowing full well they have seen this ad infinitum times. They know full well that she is dead. And the fact that she has to get up and eat food, etc., was proof of her being alive. I'm not going to go into some deepness over this story. It makes itself very clear. And note that Jesus wants them to be quiet about what has happened because, again, it's the secrecy motif that is in Mark, which states very clearly that if everybody knew exactly what he did, Jesus would be hindered even more than he is now in carrying out what he wants to carry out, which is preaching the kingdom good news and walking it and living it.
His time wasn't ready yet. So for the whole of Mark, through five, uh, four and five, what we've seen so far that Jesus has power of nature when he calms the storm, power of the demonic when he casts out the 2,000, power over sickness when he heals the woman of the 12 years, bleeding, and now the power over death through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's keep saying that. Okay, I've got four minutes to get through six verses, okay? So I need to get through this one today. Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciple to Nazareth, his hometown. He's going home. He's gone home. And actually, this is quite normal for a rabbi to go home to his hometown with his disciples with him. This is quite normal. This is not abnormal at all. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and power to perform such miracles? At that point, you think, wow, his hometown thinks he's amazing. So again, note this phrase, there's nothing that Jesus did prior to his baptism in the power of spirit. Because if he'd done anything, they wouldn't have been surprised at the miracles. Because he would have done miracles while he was living at home, Yes. But he did nothing until he started his ministry when he was baptised. And they were amazed at his teaching, his miracle abilities. But then they scoffed him. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon. And his sisters live right here among us. They, are, they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Woo! We know him. This is This is Jesus. This is Jay. We know Jay. We've seen him grow up. You think about it. It's that sort of contempt, that sort of familiarity they have with him. He's nothing special. We know his mother Mary. And we know he ain't Joseph's son. Think about it. And we've got his half-brothers and sisters here that live with us now. He's nothing special. How dare this upstart teach me anything? We saw him go through his training as a rabbi. They're offended by him. And this word offence here, by the way, um, is actually the same sort of context of a stumbling block. They're put off by Jesus, so they're not going to listen to his message. Because it's coming from somebody they know. It's not because he's got bad manners or social behaviour, but it's because he's delivering a right message, but because it's coming from Jesus, who we know really well since down here, who, by the way, is not the son of Joseph. And then note, Jesus says, a prophet is honoured everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. We so think that Mary got it. We know there's stories where they tried to get him out. I think it's in Matthew that Mary turned up to try and drag him out. Oh, your family waiting for you outside. Who are my family? Only those who do the will of my father. And it's an ever-decreasing circle. His hometown, his own relatives, and then his own family. What does it teach us? Well, I think it teaches us, actually, we for ourselves, sometimes when we might have our own family who've seen us change when we became Christians, still don't believe in Jesus. How frustrating is that? Very. Very. See, I knew you'd all react to that. It's incredibly frustrating, isn't it? It's angst-ridden. And every time you want to sit there and talk to them about Jesus and, and sort of say, really, let me pray. And look, this happened for me. I had this problem. This happened. Jesus healed or did this. Yet they still don't believe. Well, if it helps, Jesus had the same problem. And it's true, if you don't accept a prophet as a prophet, you won't get a prophet's reward. And that can work in every sense of the spirit. If you don't, I don't know, yeah, in every, you can put another title in there rather than prophet. If you don't receive a prophet as a prophet, you won't get a prophet's reward. And for me here, isn't it amazing that unless we start to believe, because of the unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles. Isn't that amazing? Because of their unbelief, 
Jesus couldn't do many miracles. Our lack of faith can be a stumbling block to the work of God's power. We can put up the barriers. We can stop God working. Let go and let God springs to mind. So, what have we actually learned from today? Well, I got this, thinking about it. We've had the crowd trying to guide Jesus to where they want him to minister. Which they were wrong. We had the bleeding woman having quiet faith that brought about healing for herself, but she was required to stand up and be counted for Jesus. We have Jairus who needed to shame himself socially and not to be distracted by the naysayers to see his daughter being brought back to life. And we have this contemptible familiar family and friends who refuse to believe because they think they know best. And they actually block kingdom business. Tells me firstly, by the way, healing is real and does occur today and can happen in this church building and can happen on the streets. Been banging on about it for six months. I believe it's something that God is calling us as a church to be open to and to be. Second, we have to stop being distracted by those who want to fulfill their own little agendas. And thirdly, we have to stand up and be counted in our community for the name of Jesus Christ. Please, will you stand? Just take a moment to allow that to sink in. Just talk to God for yourself. Let him challenge you where you've been challenged. Allow him to lift you up where you've been lifted up. Lord Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for Jairus. We never knew him, but thank you for what he did for the sake of his daughter so that we can learn from him. Thank you for the unknown woman who is more than known by you, for her humble faith reaching out to teach us also about reaching out in faith. And Lord, help us not to be part of the clambering crowd, getting you to minister where we want you. Help us to be people who follow you humbly, with no pride. People who are willing to walk in faith, in praying and reaching out for others, in seeing them healed, coming to know you. And more importantly, Lord, in boldness and empower us through the work of your Holy Spirit so that your kingdom can advance out there. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.